What a day. The diversity is just incredible. We had a TEDx at Caltech, and our idea of diversity was to sprinkle some chemistry in with the physics talks. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you ever thought about sex? I mean, <laughs> when, when you think about it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, in the Darwinian sense, survival of the fittest and all that, because why would, well, let's see, about half this audience not contribute to bearing the next generation? And what's the benefit of recombining your genetic material with somebody else's? What makes this fit? Or this? I mean, I think about this a lot. I'm inspired by the biological world, the diversity. Talk about diversity. There's nothing more diverse than the products of evolution. The functionality, the beauty of the biological world inspire me as an engineer. I would like to be able to create things that have these capabilities. I mean, imagine when it comes to extracting energy and materials from the environment, and converting those into these amazing, remarkable, self-repairing, self-reproducing machines. There's nothing like evolution for engineering beautiful objects, organisms. I would like to be able to make things like these, things that could solve human problems, and things that would inspire solutions to human problems. Of course, what does this have to do with sex? Well, let me try to get to there. All of this functionality, all of this beauty, is encoded in a simple four-letter code, strung together, the code of life. Do you know that the technology for building the code of life is such that you can sit down at your computer and type in essentially any sequence of DNA that you want. I mean, this is the code that dictates whether you are a microbe or a monkey. And you can sit down and type in a sequence and email that sequence off to your favorite purveyor of DNA, synthetic DNA in Taiwan or South Africa or Northern California. And in a few days, you will get back in the mail your physical DNA. It's pretty incredible. And in fact, some of you may remember the headlines from a couple of years ago, where Craig Venter's gang down in San Diego actually synthesized not a gene, but an entire genome, a million base pairs all strung together that encoded a simple bacterium, but a whole genome. And not only did they synthesize this from non-living materials, they put it back into a cell, another bacterium, and that cell which had lost its own DNA, started reading this DNA as if it were its own. It rebooted, so to speak. It started reproducing and following those instructions as if it were its own. This is really a remarkable capability. So I would like to be able to use this capability to build new things. And the problem is, these genomes, even of a bacterium, are intricate. They're stunningly beautiful. They're beautiful like a symphony. And we don't know how to write music like this. We can write beautiful symphonies, but we can't write anything comparable in DNA to even the simplest microbe. We can't compose that. All we're doing right now is cutting and pasting sections, maybe rearranging things a little bit. In fact, do you... TED Talks, right? They're short and sweet. That's what makes them so great. Have you all heard of the Ig Nobel Prize? One of the highlights of the Ig Nobel Prize is a nano lecture, 24 seconds long, about your field. Eric Lander did a great nano lecture for the Ig Nobel Prize in 2003. In fact, I want to read it to you because it illustrates beautifully the problem that we don't understand the inner workings of the code of life. Human Genome Project, Biology's Moonshot. 15 years, six countries, 20 centers. 
Three billion dollars, three billion letters. One dollar a letter, such a deal. 23 chromosomes, supposed to contain 100,000 genes. Turns out only to have 30,000, or maybe 25,000. Could be 40,000. Check back next year. Said to have the answer to everything, absolutely everything: diabetes, asthma, cancer, evolution, population migrations, life, death, taxes, <laughs> even the Boston Red Sox. The only problem is there's no index. Now, even better than the nano lecture is the fact that you have to write a an abstract for your talk, and that has to be in seven words or less. <laughs> so he said, "Genome bought the book, hard to read." <laughs> It was good. <laughs> So I have to admit, one of my long-held dreams is to be invited to give a nano lecture at the Ig Nobel Prize ceremonies. Not to win the prize itself—that's not really such a great thing—but to give the lecture. And in fact, I've even prepared my own abstract. So genome. This is a great story. Hard to write. Six letters. That means there's one letter left. And now we're getting to the topic of this talk. The answer to writing the genome is exactly how it's been written up until now: evolution, a very powerful algorithm for the engineering of the biological world. So I would like to be able to create new biological things. In fact, proteins, proteins, proteins do everything, right? They catalyze an amazing array of chemical reactions. They convert chemical energy into motion. They Uh, convert motion into the ability to derive food from the environment. These are the workhorses of the cell. I want to be able to make new versions of these things, and I'm going to do it not by designing them from first principles, because really no one knows how to do that. So I actually evolve them in the laboratory. Now humans have been evolving things using artificial selection. For a very long time, this is not a new concept. Everything from corn to carrier pigeons, lab rats to racehorses, we have been manipulating the biological world. Right? You've got very limited capabilities. So, for example, you can have mutations that are generated by radiation or a little bit of mutagens, like cigarette smoke, do a good job at. Sprinkling in a few random mutations, and then of course there's sex, right? So, but that's very limited. Monkeys go with monkeys, and worms with worms. Never the two shall meet. Two parents always within species. But remember, we can synthesize any DNA we want. So this is not the limitation in the <laughs> test tube. In the test tube, you can have two parents to 32 parents. You can combine monkeys and worms. You can go anywhere your imagination or curiosity take you. Now, this is actually a gift and a problem, of course, because in the natural world, you only have a few parameters to play with. In the test tube, I have to make all the decisions, not only of who breeds with whom, but who lives and who dies, and. You're not even sure where you want to go, and the problem is the most of the ways that you can recombine DNA, especially from distant species, makes perfect garbage. Absolutely nothing that even functions, much less has any value. So the real challenge in a frontier like this is to figure out how to make something wonderful. How do you make something that's wonderful, that's beautiful, like? What nature has already provided, and that solves a problem for humans. Okay, hold your breath. We're going to take a dive into science for a couple of minutes. See how long you can hold your breath. Let me tell you what forcing molecules to have sex in the laboratory looks like. And remember, up in Pasadena, we have a really good time with this. <laughs> I take genetic material that encodes proteins, those lovely three-dimensional objects that. Catalyze interesting chemical reactions, and even if they come from very distant species, this is what we've learned by studying their sequences and studying evolution. They encode proteins of similar three-dimensional structures if they came about by divergent evolution—that is, accumulating mutations 
over multiple generations and undergoing natural selection. And that means when I recombine these, and I'm just illustrating it here with three because I can, when you recombine or force these things to have sex in the test tube, they will start making new proteins. And you can make lots and lots of sequences this way, hundreds and thousands of sequences. These are the children of the molecules, and the great thing about my experiments is I can throw the vast majority of the children away <laughs> if I don't like them. So here, it encodes a similar molecule, similar three-dimensional structure if I'm lucky, but then that will learn how to do something new. So the scientific question that we have to deal with is how do you do this safely, right? What does safe sex mean? It means that you create usually functional molecules because we really don't want to create garbage. And so I have to figure out, well, if I've got control over this process, how do I do it in such a way that I have a good chance of making something that's beautiful or useful? And here we have to steal back from computer science some of the things they stole from us in the first place, right? Genetic algorithms. And we can apply simple rules like thou shalt break the fewest interactions. And we can look at the protein as a network of interactions and apply well-known algorithms to finding global optimal solutions to how you force molecules to have sex. What have I learned by this? This is really fun to do because we learn some very important things that we really don't know by studying the natural world. Now, one thing we already did know is that sex is conservative, right? When two parents get together, two human parents get together, they usually create functional humans, right? Two eyes, two ears, you know, usually. When two cats get together, you get functional cats. But the great thing about sex is the innovation that comes about. Not only do you get functional children, but they're different from you. And if you look at thousands of molecules or thousands of children, you find that a significant fraction lie within the properties of parents, right? They kind of look like their parents. But there's a, uh, a long tail of dummies, right? But if you're lucky, you have children who are smarter than you are. And in fact, progeny that can do things that you are not able to do. Well, you get to see this in the test tube. When we recombine DNA, we find that these progeny molecules have learned, have acquired the capabilities to do things that their parent molecules never knew how to do. And this is the innovation generation. That's what goes on in sex. It creates within conservatism. It's a machine for doing that. So just to give you a little flavor of some of the things that my laboratory has been able to make over the years, for example, we can take human enzymes, these arginase enzymes, scavenge a nutrient from the bloodstream that's required by certain tumors. And the enzymes that you have in your body are not good for treating cancer because they don't last long when they're injected into the bloodstream. They can't be turned into drugs. So people use things like these enzymes from bacteria, but those cause terrible immune reactions when you inject them into humans. So we can take human versions of these enzymes and breed them together, creating new versions of the enzyme that have never existed before, but that are better than any of the parents they started with. They can last much longer in the bloodstream and perhaps someday be used to treat these cancers. Another thing we've been able to do is take enzymes, proteins. These are these catalysts that you can literally scrape from the bottom of your shoe, from soil microorganisms. And these enzymes can break down toxic materials. You have a bunch of them in your liver. These are called cytochrome P450s. And the ones in your liver are the things that metabolize the drugs and various other nasty things that you put into your bodies, and they um, create metabolites. When you take drugs, those metabolites can cause problems for you, and that is uh, a whole area of research in pharmaceutical laboratories to try to figure out and anticipate. So we can make versions of the bacterial enzymes that mimic all the human capabilities so that you can make gram quantities of drugs and actually use of the metabolites of drugs and actually use them to test the toxicity before they go into human beings. One of the big problems that 
I'm particularly interested in is, of course, how do we use this capability of biology, this amazing functionality. Biology can do such incredible things about extracting energy from the environment. I would like to be able to create versions of simple microorganisms that could do the same thing to solve a human problem. And so a vision is that we could engineer and evolve microbes to stop solving their problem. What's their problem? They take food and make more microbes. That's not useful for us. But if they took food and turned it into, if they took food in the form of sunlight, for example, or uh, biomass or garbage, and turned it into the chemicals that we need for our daily lives, then we wouldn't be pumping our riches out of the ground as we're doing today and living in a completely non-sustainable way. So this is just a little short foray into the world of manipulating DNA in novel ways and the kinds of problems that one might be able to solve with that. And the getting back to the sex part, this is a very fun thing to explore. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know where many of these experiments will take it, take us, but the exploration will be a lot of fun. Thank you very much.